Hello, and welcome to our session about modular Android development. I'm Thanos Karpuzi, senior Android developer for Bubble. Uh, I am Fred, also a senior developer at Bubble. And today we will give you some insights about our last few months in Bubble where we try to move from our monolithic application setup to a modular one. We will focus on configuration and setup, tooling, and best practices in code. Uh, so first of all, the big question, what is modular, why modular? Some context behind that. So a year ago in Bubble, we switched our backend from the monolithic application to microservice architecture. Uh, our backenders convinced us that this is the new big thing. That's how things should be done now. It's more maintainable. It provides better velocity, faster velocity to deliver uh, and maintain. And we give it a try. So from the very beginning, we understand that that was a way to ship our product faster. At that point, it was only the API affected. It was way faster than us. And then also, they managed to have clear ownership about our uh, code. They made the uh, Amazon motto of, you build it, you run it, true. And also, we figured it out that it works way better with Scrum. We, we do Scrum better. So after a few months, we decided to change our team setup to follow that pattern, to have full stack teams. And we came to a point that we had to update our client setup, client project setup, in a way that will take the advantage of this uh, configuration. So that's how we started. So how do our teams look right now? We have full stack teams, which contain Android, iOS, front-end, back-enders, designers, and our product owners we, could, we couldn't avoid. And uh, we're implementing Scrum. We have focus, uh, we focus on this change to reduce the dependencies between the teams, avoid the overhead of communicating and allying, but just deliver code, uh, deliver, code deliver features, and in a lean way. And we believe by now that we have achieved it in a great extent. So we asked ourselves, how can we actually help the teams developing if uh, we're going to have a new application that can be split? So as, as an overview here, we have uh, our new app. And as you can see, there's a shared component that offers the UI widget and also the common functionality. Uh, all the features are actually split across the modules. And then we have a core application that kind of orchestrates all these modules and the dependency injection scopes. So what I want to do here today with Thanos is show and share our experience with this, uh, well, this procedure. So basically, right from the beginning, we define how each module is actually set up. So most of them have a presentation layer as well as, well a, logic, uh, a business logic layer. They interact through repositories, and uh, we decided to do this because if we're going to have full stack teams, we want them to actually be able to work as vertically as possible without interfering with other teams. By having, for example, the network inside the module, then they're free to change the API contract if they need uh, without touching other modules. Uh, an awesome benefit for this, from this is that you can actually um, control the flow of input and output, and which is very good for unit testing, as we found out. So this is an overview of our project. As you can see, most of the folders are just modules. And it basically starts with Gradle, right? We're not here to reinvent the wheel. We are reusing what exists already. So all of you know that Gradle actually offers this uh, module functionality, so we just leverage it. We also have, at the top level of the project, all the configuration that we can have, uh, Gradle configuration there is, and then each module applies uh, this configuration as they wish. Um, let me show you what I mean. So some of you might know what this is already. Uh, we, we don't want to take credit for it. We just used it as well. So at the top level of the project, we have a groovy file that basically just uh, we pin the libraries to the project um, scope. Uh, in this case, we have Dagger here. So as we move on to the modules, this is an example of our track browser module. It, we just gather these uh, libraries from the project scope as well. As for the modules themselves, we rather keep it the old way. 
Uh, there's one or two reasons for this, but the main thing that we found out is that if you want to use Android Studio features like renaming, it's better to have it like this, uh, either than have it pinned in uh, some other scope. Uh, here, there's uh, uh, something I would like to, to show you. So this is the application build Gradle file, right? It depends on the track browser, which is another module that we have. Uh, we can't really have um, circular dependencies, so in fact, we end up with this scenario. So we have the application module that knows about all the others, but all, all the others are actually quite isolated. So how can we actually manage dependencies that are completely tied with the application lifecycle if our module doesn't really know anything about this, depend uh, this uh, lifecycle? So Thanos came up with uh, an idea. <laughs> Which was, yeah, okay, so the track browser, it doesn't really need to know how to create this component or manage it. It just needs to know how to get it and just needs to know how, it, uh, how the component actually behaves. Uh, it is defined, I'm sorry. So here we define an interface that we just call track browser application, which uh, says that whoever implements this must be able to return a track browser component which is also defined within the track browser module. In the core application then, since we have access to the track browser, we do create the dagger component and we manage its lifecycle here. Back on the track browser, we are free to use uh, the component as we wish throughout our activities as it is pinned to the application. We do advise you to actually check if uh, the application extends that. We just uh, reduce the code here. Uh, and that's it for Tiger. But obviously, uh, usually the projects are more complicated. You don't have just dependencies from top level to uh, lower level. You have also different modules that have different functionality that needs to be used from other modules. Or you just need to pass information between the two. So. How can we do that? How can we keep uh, our modules isolated but still have some kind of communication directly through code? First of all, we take advantage of the Android APIs. So we are using intents, we are using broadcast receivers, but that's not always enough. Um, we could always have a simple interface and then have a dependency to the, um, to the other module and call it directly, but we wanted to go a step further. We wanted to make it even more isolated. Uh, so we are applying the command pattern in this case. So how does that work? You have module one that has a piece of functionality. Let's say in our case, you're gonna start a lesson and uh, the module two needs to just know how to start a lesson. Actually, he doesn't know how to start a lesson. He just needs to start a lesson. So in the code, we have a simple interface that lives in the module one uh, in this pattern called the receiver that says, I can start a lesson. This is how it exposes the functionality to the rest of the project. And then we have a concrete implementation in the receiver in the same module about uh, a command that can be executed from anyone. In this case, it's a simple intent that starts a new activity. It could be easily anything else. So it has all the logic how this feature can actually start, can actually be used. And then on the module two, who actually wants to start a lesson, we use uh, Dagger2 to pass this uh, command uh, and then easily start a lesson. What's the best part? Why we do that? As we said, we want to keep the modules isolated. Right now, we know that a lesson is uh, an activity, but module 2 doesn't need to know that. It does just need to pass the information to start the lesson. That means that if later on we change it to a dialogue or we change it to um, whatever, a website, it doesn't matter, an SMS, only module two, uh, only module one requires to make changes. We don't even need a pull request for the other uh, module. That keeps everything cleaner. And that's how we isolate code and responsibilities in our modular setup. Now that we have um, give you an overview of how we set up our project in means of Android Studio Gradle and how we have basic communication between different modules, let's see where all of our code base lives. So we have a couple of alternatives. 
but we selected to just have a single Git repository for all of, of our modules. You might ask, why is that? You always say that autonomy, you always say that uh, isolate things, that doesn't seem to follow the same pattern. Well, we just, in this case, we try to keep it stupid simple. Uh, why? First of all, we want to fail fast. We want the developer that makes a change, break an API, uh, break an interface, break the Gradle setup, the first time that he will click uh, instant run, the first time that he will click play on his Android Studio, he will get the failure before even he commits. Everything else gets cast. Everything else might have a weird state that you don't see the, uh, the error. So that's the cleanest way. And we also wanted to have centralized quality gates, which are way easier to be implemented in this setup. Of course, we are losing some of the, um, some of, um, the functionality that we had in other setups, such as versioning its module independently. That was not very important for us, but I guess other projects might need something like that. And we have increased our build times uh, before the instant run feature. It was terrible. I will come back to both of those shortly. So what was the, our other options that we um, tried? First of all, was to use Git submodules and subtrees. Um, that had a huge overhead in pull requests. What does that mean? Um, so, to the previous example of cross module communication, you have to implement your code in your first repository, commit it, make a pull request. Then you have to go to the second one, commit, uh, make the changes, commit it, and make the pull request. And then Fred here will have to preview both of them. He has to keep in mind all of the context of the changes in two different pull requests. He needs to make meaningful uh, comments and help the developer fix the, pro the issues. And that's a good scenario. The bad scenario is something was, goes wrong, and then you have to revert your changes. And then you have a state of code in different repositories that are not compatible. So it had a huge overhead for us. We didn't show that many um, great value on having this setup, so we dismiss it. The other option was to use Maven repositories, uh, set up a Maven Nexus and uh, store our executable form of the modules right away. The problem for us, it was uh, during this uh, migration, we had to work uh, actively in most of our modules. That means that we will have to update the version and keep our project set up, keep our Gradle files all the time updated. And that was not the best solution for us. Uh, it had some problems. And as I said before, versioning of its module uh, by itself, it was not something important for us. Of course, we see the value on this uh, approach. And when we have modules that they will be more stable, they will not have that many code changes, we will uh, probably go back to that setup as well. And um, I've talked about quality gates in the previous slides. So when you're working in a distributed uh, setup, when you have Android developers in four or five different teams, it's really hard to ensure your quality gates and maintain the, the high development standard. So we focus on having automated checks. And specifically, we wanted to have code coverage in unit tests. We wanted to have linters and static code analysis. And um, I'm not going to talk about uh, linting because we are just using the Android lint and it's only relevant for us on the release candidate state. It works like in every other uh, solution and just use the CI to merge all of the different reporting. But let's look into the code coverage. So uh, Zacoco gathers all the information from the execution and the coverage. And the important for us was we want to reduce the boilerplate on our Gradle files. We already have a lot of them. We have to maintain them. We want to keep it simple. So again, Fred here wrote by copy-pasting uh, Stack Overflow this, uh, this piece of code on our main Gradle, on the project level uh, uh, Gradle file, which just enables the, uh, the Jacoco plugin in every sub-module, and it passes the basic configuration. And also, we are leveraging the groovy variables that uh, Gradle uh, uses to, ex uh, to externalize the Jacoco exclusion rules. In our case, it's all the dagger to auto-generated code that just mess your uh, code coverage. Of course, since we talk about uh, autonomy and isolation, we wanted to have um, module-level um, code coverage. We want the developer to be able to use um, um, the Gradle uh, build on his own machine and see what's happening. So we are using a, a we created a template. We created a template on the um, 
on our ID that copies and adds this uh, piece of uh, Gradle code in every submodule. And again, uh, using variables, uh, groovy variables set up in the project level, we don't have to configure it, it for each module uh, independently. And um, for static code analysis, find bugs. It's a nice plugin. It's a nice tool. It works uh, really well uh, directly with the ID, and it, it has support for most of the CIs out there. And uh, again, a gr a groovy variables about uh, where it's to the store, what's the name of the project, what's the build directory, and everything else. It's stored. It's created once. It's stored there. Just a template on our, uh, your ID. You don't have to write anything. So about the CI topic, um, couple, well, one year ago, Thanos uh, presented that he actually integrated Jenkins in Bubble, but we found out that with the project with this size and so much configuration, it was time to retire Jenkins because it's also a great maintenance project there. So we moved to a cloud solution. For those who don't know, it's uh, Bitrise, which already brings loads of uh, out-of-the-box integrations plus reports and uh, distribution of the app. This is how it looks on Bitrise. This is our internal workflow. Um, obviously, the bullet points don't match exactly there because we just want to summarize the most important ones. So we obviously build and test our code like you should do as well. We generate coverage report and run it through CodeCov. I'll, I'll talk about CodeCov in a second. We link the code, run the static analysis, and distribute either internally or externally. CodeCov is an awesome service to visualize your code coverage. So it even offers like comments on PRs. But the best feature is that you can actually set a threshold for your coverage. And if the PR doesn't actually meet that goal, then we mark the build as failed. Uh, this way, everyone is informed that the developer should either write tests or remove code that makes no sense. And uh, we keep our quality gate up there as, as much as we can. And since we are basically done with such a configuration, what can you actually learn from us? Uh, so this is not the de facto standard. This is what we did through the past one year, nine months. So we, we went from a monolith app to a modular one. And our advice is to first identify which fe features you can actually isolate in this, mo uh, this uh, mo uh, monolith. And the easiest way to do this is actually define the communication interfaces between these features, because then you can just simply put them in a new module. The, the worst part for us was that we learned the hard way not to centralize the configuration. So you should centralize it because it was a hell trying to find all these configuration bits amongst all the modules. Uh, kind of the same way goes for the Android resources. It's just more sane to keep them in a single module. And last but not least, and perhaps the most important thing, start small, start with new features. So you, you, you identify a feature that you want to add, and you just add it as a module instead of adding to your app. If you reiterate this process and eventually also start slicing that monolith into modules, you'll see that it will start dissolving. Nevertheless, prepare for a really bumpy road. Yep. Exactly. So it took us a couple of months to, uh, to get to a state that we can actually work with this setup, and it took us even longer to have meaningful work and not waste our time. Um, and the biggest problem was uh, the groundwork. We didn't exactly know what should be part of that, what needs to be changed, how we can identify slices from our monolith to separate them in different modules, how we set up the cross-module communication, how we reduce a boilerplate. Um, so that's kind of painful. I hope that this session helped you, give you some hints. Of course, every code base is different, so you have to play around with tools, you have to play around with configurations. Then we had the, pro the big problem with the build times. Uh, a few months ago, before the instant run, we had, a, uh, we had a project that required up to 12 to 14 minutes, including tests, to be built. It. That was impossible to work with. Now with instant run, this is solved by default. We are down to a couple of seconds to have the build on our phones. Uh, so you can develop, you can debug easily. It's a better world for this modular architecture.
And then you have the configuration overhead, which means you have multiple Gradle files. There is no templates out there. You have to manually sync it. You have to manually identify what you can set up as a template. Android Studio is very um, easy, uh, very helpful for you to define templates. We can uh, even also show, us, uh, show you in, uh, in our blog how you can actually do that, but it's very straightforward. And then you have the permission handling. And by permission, it's, um, you have to keep in mind that all of your, of your user's permission, all of your activities need to be declared on your main, on your uh, application uh, manifest. There is no way to automate that. You have to keep it in mind. You have to get the exceptions. Uh, and it's even worse now if you are building for N uh, or M. Um, and of course, you have the uh, localization and style conflicts. It's a simple solution. You just have to, strict, uh, to have strict naming conventions. But uh, there is also not real tooling for that. You have to be yourself and your team disciplined and enforce your own rules. And then you have the code application, which I don't think it's a big problem, but you, are, do, you do lose your single point of truth in, in functionality. Uh, and I want to close this session by stating our opportunities, what make us, what motivate us, what keep us going through that. From the very beginning, I said that uh, we, we were able to have clear ownership of our code and our features to the teams, to the developers. Um, that makes simple uh, the maintenance, that makes simple the iteration uh, with, the, with the product. And also, we gain fine-grained uh, reporting. We have a top-level project overview that anybody can just check the latest build or just get an email that gives you an overview of the quality of the project, of the changes. That's very powerful. And then you have the detailed module reporting that empowers the developer to understand what, how their deltas affect the project, uh, what goes wrong before it actually goes wrong, prevent the problems. And also, this modular setup provides us with sandbox environments, which are great for experimentation, which means we can play with tools and libraries for smaller features. We can even ship to production. An extreme example, we didn't try it. I hope you don't try it either. You might use Retrofit, and you're going to check out Volley. You can implement a small, non-business crucial feature and ship it to production and see how it behaves. Please do it with smaller libraries. Um, and also, we can play with our pro um, um, product increments. What does that mean? We can have separate flows. We can have different features shipped with a typical A-B test um, uh, frameworks. But then to maintain it or to, to remove it, to kill it, it's as simple as just deleting a folder from your project. Nothing else will be affected. And then we also have standalone feature app demos um, that help our QA team to just get the features that they care about, nothing else about the team specific, nothing else about the state of the backend. Uh, just a simple small demo. Even before we had the core application there, they, can, uh, they were ab able to test things that they were not integrated and with tailored configuration for them. And last but not least, we, um, we have now the ability to create instant Android apps, the new feature that will come shortly. Uh, without any code changes. It depends on modules. It depends on just having a separate APK build. That just requires to have a separate mod um, manifest. That's it. It just takes an hour, a couple of hours to have that. We have played around with it, uh, but that's all. We don't know yet how it will look, um, but we will have more information for you in the future. So that's it. We're wrapping it up here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you have questions, if you want more details, please visit our blog. Thank you. First question over here. Ah, oh, fuck. Uh, Just one second. Okay, will you do me a favor? Will you do us all a favor and keep quiet until the Q&A session is done? Nobody will be able to understand anything else. Thank you. Uh, can you tell me, what's the final product of the whole building process? Is it one APK as one monolith application or uh, every single module is uh, APK or JAR so, or something so like that? So we have, uh, we are basing our modules either as Java libraries or Android libraries. That means that you can have, you, or of course, you build a single APK at the end, but you can have the AARs or JAR files. And then you're, um, you're taking advantage of Gradle, and then you can either use directly the executables in your, uh, in your main project, or you can just build the whole project every time, the whole sub-module, 
and it's based on your configuration. You have the ability to, bo to do both. Of course, at the end, you have a single uh, APK. Okay. Uh, so are you, uh, are you able to just, um, if you find, for example, bug or something uh, in uh, one module, uh, are you able to just uh, fix that bug and deploy just that library to the end users? Well, we are talking about dynamic code loading now. This is a separate logic. That's a separate uh, way of doing things. Obviously, if you have your communication between modules, if you have your uh, setup like that, it's way easier to say that you load the, um, the code from anywhere else. But that goes out of the scope of this presentation. Dynamic code loading, uh, it's a complicated issue. There is a lot of security problems. We are not actually using it. We tried it. We play around. It never reached production. Um, it's not. For me, I would not suggest it, but obviously it makes it easier to have a library, uh, to, to have a solution that uh, allows to have dynamic code loading. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a question. Can you define, like, uh, what's the one module? Like, define the feature? Is it, like, if you have, like, map and order activity, or I know, do you put that, like, into separate modules, or what, what's your definition of the feature? Well. Feature is a, a unit that has specific functionality that it can be used by its own or by other modules. For example, tracking is one module for us. Uh, the, the lesson player, the, the core part of our application, how we teach people new languages, is a separate module. Our navigation is a separate module. Usually, it has a full stack of having view and business logic. Sometimes, it just have business logic. It's something that you can expose an interface, or can expose some functionality, and it doesn't depend to something else. Okay, thank or you. Or it depends in a clear way. Hi, uh, I have a question about the full stack team setup you have mm -hmm. in your company. Uh, you said you have like one or two Android developers, an iOS developer, and front end developer, etc. And my question is, how do you deal with pull requests? Uh, because obviously an Android developers wouldn't probably want to look at iOS code. And in my team, the Android developers, even though we are separate across two or three teams, we look at each other's code. But we still have to have some information about what's going on in the other team. And how do you deal with that? That's the million dollar question there. Um, I know. <laughs> we, we, we tried a lot of different things. Um, we try to focus on our T-shaping and Android developers uh, pre-reviewing uh, iOS code and the other way around. Some developers have enough knowledge, have enough context to, for other languages to do that, but it, it's not always the case. It, um, so now we are using the four eyes rule. Most of the time we allow the team for, more, for small changes to just make their own um, uh, previews. If it's something that's going to be reused, let's say tracking, let's say part of navigation, a UI component, uh, we try to have um, an Android developer from another team take a look. And of course, <laughs> and of course, we do try to have open communication channels between the Android uh, developers at all time. We usually meet once or twice a week and talk about the changes, uh, about the crucial paths on our development. It's not a perfect way. We, were, uh, we had the opportunity to talk with some uh, Android developers of Spotify who are kind of the leading uh, company on that uh, full stack and mobile. They also haven't figured it out. Um, now they have a weird setup that uh, they have a rolling way of each team uh, peer reviews the other team's code. We are still playing around. At this point, though, we have the 4 I um, rule. Most of the time, your team and, an, and a different other developer has to look uh, through your code if it's not uh, something that you can check just with um, automated checks. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. And now we're looking for the one million dollars and shall pay them right after lunch in case we find them. Oh, no, we have one more question. Sorry. Final one. Um, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, so my question is, um, so you showed some Gradle setup that you basically centralize the third-party dependencies. Um, so, um, so the case is, for example, uh, there is like a new support library, and one team says, oh, okay, we want to use that. We, we want to like bump it and, and update our code to it. But the other team says, okay, we don't want to do that. So how do you approach those situations, especially well, when, when there are like code breaks? or let's, let's say the other way around. 
Do you care about your APK, what you're shipping? Do you care about your uh, method name limit? Do you care about the size of your APK? You should not externalize, you should not push to your users the problems that you have between two teams. Um, so that solves the problem. You need, and obviously, yeah, that's if we break it, sorry. <laughs> um, you need to make a decision there. You could not centralize it, or you can have two different variables and have that, but you are messing up with your APK. Care for your users, care for your Play Store, and care less about uh, having to fight about, do we need a new library or not? You probably need it. It probably solves problems. Yep, thank you. Thanks. That was it, I guess. Okay, thanks a lot, guys, for an inspiring and interesting talk.